Hey folks, it's Andy. No time for a silly intro today. Uh, welcome to Kendall Run. Let's get right into the questions. Okay, number one. I've been living, working and practicing kendo in Japan for six years. Uh, my Japanese is in intermediate level, but I still have a hard time understanding small children and the elderly. Uh, the other day, my sensei invited me to attend practice at a nearby dojo. Uh, he said the practice would focus on kihon uh, waza. It sounded good, so I accepted the invitation. When I first arrived, I didn't recognize anyone. <laughs> I've been in this situation. <laughs> Um, the dojo sensei was an uh, 80 year old elderly man. Uh, he spoke very fast with a rough sounding voice. In other words, I couldn't understand him. Um, it was good practice, but I found myself more focused on linguistics than was I. As a result, I made a lot of amateur mistakes. Uh, there were a few times I completely misunderstood the sensei. Uh, for example, the type of waza, number of strikes, uh, or who performs the waza first. Uh, it wasn't before long I realized I was slowing down practice. Also, I could tell that my partners were becoming frustrated. Uh, I f haven't felt like this since the first day of uh, Kendall practice, not to mention it was embarrassing. Overall, the practice itself was great, perfect for reviewing the basics. Also, after practice, Sensei thanked me for coming, asked me what country I'm from, uh, and told me to come again. Uh, I want to go again, but I don't want to be a nuisance to the students by slowing down practice because of my own ability to fully understand the sensei. Uh, my question is, during your time in Japan, have you or other foreigners you've known ever been in a similar situation? I mean, one way you had a hard time understanding the sensei or other Japanese students and felt a bit of tension between you uh, and your classmates because of it. If so, how did you or the others deal with it? Okay, so yeah, I, I've got a bit of a similar experience with this, actually, um, where I've been sort of invited to a practice. I've gone there and then like even the person that invited me didn't show up and I'm just there like this random foreign guy in there. <laughs> uh, and nobody knows who I am. Um, yeah, which is a bit weird. Um, and yeah, like when I first went over there, I didn't speak Japanese so well at all. So uh, yeah, there was a few times when I didn't really know what was going on. Um, most of the people I dealt with were quite helpful though. Um, I mean, I think the best thing you can do in that situation is just do your best to try not to focus too much on like understanding every word of the Japanese perfectly. Just try your best to kind of follow along with what everyone's doing. Um, one thing you can do like is, I mean, it happens sometimes even in like a country where you fully understand the language, um, where maybe you didn't quite hear what was said or something like that. What you can do is instead of necessarily, um, obviously, I think it's totally fine for you to ask the teacher um, or not even the teacher, ask your partner, oh, what, what is it we're doing or um, am I doing this right? You know, um, if you feel like you're becoming a burden on the other people, then uh, what you can do is when the teacher says something like, oh, I wonder what he just said. I don't really know what, <laughs> I don't really know what we're supposed to do. And I don't feel comfortable asking the person because I don't want to annoy him. Um, is before they start, you know, uh, when you sort of, you come together, you know, you do day, you come together, maybe you do song cue, maybe you don't, it depends. Uh, you, you do day. And just, just before the other person starts, just, just, just stop and just look, just watch the other students. The other person will recognise you don't fully understand what's going on. And if you just watch what's happening, then you'll be able to guess kind of what, what you're supposed to be doing just by watching. Um, and maybe the other person, if they're feeling helpful, will come over and say, oh, by the way, it's, we're supposed to be doing, uh, I don't know, like uh, it says Kihon practice. So I'm, I doubt they're having you doing anything super, super difficult or complicated. So it's like, oh, you're supposed to be doing four times big men or something like that. Um, and do it that way. Um, I can't imagine people getting too frustrated with you. I mean, just try not to just stop the flow of the practice as much as you can. And like I say, try and just try and just pick up what it is that it's, you're supposed to be doing and hopefully, um, you know, without focusing too much on the, the, the language and, and just kind of try and pay attention to what's going on around you. Sounds like the, the teacher is gen genuinely pleased for you to go there, genuinely happy for you to carry on going there. So um, I definitely think you should keep do keep going. Um, I, I don't think anyone resents you or like uh, is upset with you going there either. So definitely keep 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 at it. Keep at it. I'm sure you'll I'm sure you'll I'm sure you'll you'll get to grips with it uh, in time. Okay, next one. Um, can you explain the positions on a kendo team and their roles for me, please? Uh, actually, I've done this in a previous video, but I'll go through them quickly again. So generally, most kendo teams have five players. There's different ones though. Sometimes you've got three. Sometimes you've got seven. Sometimes it's like. 30 depends on the type of match um generally uh it's uh sempo the first one sempo uh which is usually um 
you usually pick somebody that's likely to win <laughs> um, and it has quite a good uh, energetic fast style of kendo aggressive style of kendo is usually good something that's going to get set the mood for the rest of the, the match uh, next is jiho the next person he's going to uh that person's going to uh take the torch and pass it on so they they're also going to want somebody that's they're going to be somebody that you want to be quite uh, aggressive likely to win likely to be able to turn uh, sorry to carry that torch and pass it on to the um to the next player who is the chuken the chuken is the middle player the third player now that's a very important position it's a position i played a lot um sort of in my uh later career uh, with the british team i used to be senpo uh, i pre played that the most probably senpo during my younger years um and then i i, I moved to chuken um which is a position which is like a kind of you need the chuken to be pretty solid because if your senpo and your jiho don't bring home the bacon <laughs> and uh, and they do they do lose their matches you've got to turn it around then so that your ch your team has a chance of still winning um so they they kind of a a kind of a, a taisho uh, which is the 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 fifth position uh, before the Taisho in a way. Uh, they're the ones that's going to turn turn the, turn the whole mood of the Shi'ai around. Uh, then you've got Fukusho, which is like the, the fourth position. That Again, someone that's going to uh, connect the result from the uh, the Chuken to the uh, the Taisho, but it's, a, it's, it's more important in a way or a, a kind of a heavier burden than the Jiho has because, uh, you, you again, you might be in a position where you're under a lot more pressure. Say the first and the second player lose their matches. The Chuken doesn't manage to uh, to bring a victory but gets a draw. Well, then the, the hook show is going to have to go out there and do some work so that you still got a chance of winning the match. And then, of course, the, the Taisho, that's the... Uh, the <laughs> just put my little finger over that. I mean something different in Japan. But anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, the Taisho is the fifth position. Um this one uh, <laughs> so uh that's um the tai show is the, the 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 fifth position that is uh often played by the team captain uh usually the strongest player on the team uh the, the person that if if everybody draw it, it's a draw by the time it gets to there the whole match is going to sort of lynch on um on that particular player so uh yeah th that's that's kind of how it goes now obviously Lots of us, especially in the West, we don't have the the kind of privilege of choosing the style of players for our team necessarily. So sometimes we just have to um, choose it in different ways. Some ways we choose it in order of age. Sometimes it's in order of grade or experience. So uh, that also depends on the tournament as well. So yeah, hope that helps. <laughs> Okay, um, this is the last one I'm going to do because this is quite a long question. It's got four parts. Um, and then uh, I'll, I know there's still loads more on the Kendo Show Early Access group and on YouTube and stuff. Kendo Show Early Access group, there's a link in the description. It's a great place to post your comments. It's a free group to join, so make sure you're in the group if you're not already. I say it every time. <laughs> um, okay, uh, next one. Uh, I have some questions for you that are really bothering me for quite a long time. Uh, number one, I have a problem in my stance while attacking. I tend to bend forward with my hands right in front of me. Uh, it isn't that bad. I mean, it doesn't look that bad, but I have con consequences that my right leg is too quick and my left leg falls behind. So my left leg stays in the air for some time. The bigger problem is that I don't know how to attack with my whole body uh, and not just my other upper body and the lower body is falling behind. Uh, and I have a problem in super I don't know how to push my hips. Uh, I do it in my arms and I get tired eventually. So now I can fix the problem. Yeah, you can fix the problem with a lot of basic practice of, of uh, Ash Sabaki. Um, it's very difficult for me to just say over the internet how to fix it. One thing that you might find is that your left heel is too high off the ground. That's a very common problem. Um, and uh, why? If, if your left heel's very high off the ground, then it tends to, the left leg tends to stay behind. It tends to flick up in the air like you're describing. Uh, but basically, you can fix it right from the start, just doing suriyashi just uh, across your, your living room or whatever, in your kitchen, whatever. One, two, one, two, just across. But make sure when the right foot goes, the instant it stops, bam, this comes straight up quickly. One, two. One, two. One, two. This like, not one, two. One, two. Not like this. One, two, one, two, like this. And if you practice like that, I'm telling you, you do that for half an hour, <laughs> uh, it's going to feel like forever. And you're going to have like, a, you're going to have, you're going to feel it in your legs. It's like leg day. <laughs> uh, okay, next one. 
and on part two, I saw your explanation video on what is correct Zantian in your opinion and I sent your video on top to my sensei and he told me that you are right, but on my level, I'm Kusha. I don't, if I don't perform Zantian while turning my, by turning my back on the opponent, then the referees will not think I'm performing Zantian and they might just think you stop the attack and they won't reward me with an Ippon. Uh, in this case, what should I do? I'm asking because I really don't like passing my opponent. It just doesn't feel natural to me. I always make my Zantian simple and quick, but loud. Don't get me wrong, I understand the point, but they're telling me to do that in order to understand uh shikai to free myself from fear doubt hesitation the feeling of... okay so basically you saw my video on uh zanshin where i said that hitting and going past and leaving your back to the opponent isn't zanshin and it's not and i stand by that you said that to your teacher he said yeah that's true but at your level he wants you to concentrate on hitting and going past fair enough follow what your teacher says totally fine however here's what i will say on what you've commented on in terms of the shi'ai right if you do zanshin correctly which isn't hitting and stopping in front of the opponent you still have to separate from the opponent all right it's just you don't turn your back on them you hit you go towards the opponent and you pass them keeping your eyes on them and then you, you go backwards with your eyes on them still man this way and then finishing kamae and there's separation from the opponent you don't just hit and stop man if you do that, then yes, the Shinpan are not going to give you Ippon because it does look like you just hit and stop because you did just hit and stop. But if you have Zanshin, exactly like I showed you in that video, they, there ain't no way they're not going to give you Ippon for that. No way is they're not going to give you Ippon for that. The difficulty is, is I understand what your sensei is saying and they want you to kind of uh, practice in that way because maybe, I, I don't know, it's hard for me to say that, but personally... Um, I, I, if you're doing the Zanshin right, how I'm telling you, and it's kind of regardless of the level, really, you'll still be awarded points uh, if the Shinpan know what they're doing. Um, but I'm not your sensei. Do what your sensei says. <laughs> uh, three, um, when I started practicing Kendall, my ki was very weak and it came from my throat. I was shouting, it was high pitch. Uh, now I understand it should come from my stomach and I tend to make very low pitch. Uh, nat natural, nat uh, I naturally have a lower pitch voice even though I'm a girl uh, uh, I don't know what to do about it especially during Zanshin when it really matters do you think I might get my ki to sound natural if I try to copy someone else's ki -ai? that's good uh, potentially but there's nothing wrong with having kind of a low pitched ki -ai. it's not you know it's not wrong to have the low pitched ki -ai. um so yeah, I mean, but if you know, yeah, if if there's somebody's ki -ai that you like, there's nothing wrong with, uh, or the shouting, the sound that they make when they shout that you kind of like or think is quite good, then there's nothing wrong with sort of copying that for now. You you know, you mentioned already that you're still at the sort of beginning of your Kendall journey, so don't worry about it too much. Right, just shout as loud as you can. Yeah, it should come from your stomach and your abdomen or whatever, or your diaphragm really. But for the time being, just shout as loud as you can. Right? When you start getting into Dan grades and stuff, you can start worrying more about whether you're doing it in the exact right way. Uh, but for now, focus on doing it at the same time as you hit and as loud as you possibly can. Uh, and the rest will come with time. Uh, finally, how can I get more aware of my opponent's strikes? Uh, it's like I don't even know if uh, he got me somewhere, if I'm attacking at the same time or nearly at the same time. I'm aware if I get uh, hit, slapped, if I'm still stand, if I'm standing still or just defending myself. But if I'm attacking as well, I don't have a, a clue of my opponent's strikes. Uh, my concentration is full but focused only on my own moves. Okay, so what he's saying is, is when you make an attack at the same time as your opponent and they hit you, uh, sometimes you don't realize you've been hit you, you know obviously if you're stood still and they hit you re you recognize it but because you're obviously so concentrating on making your hits you don't always uh realize that you've been hit yourself that's fine it'll come with time again um honestly it'll come with more more experience don't worry about it too much um it's just there isn't something you can do to to ga gain more awareness in that respect it's just patience <laughs> for want of a better term really because you will you will start to recognize it more you really will um but as you, as you start to become more and more experienced you'll start your movements will become more natural and they won't require as much um active concentration from you all the time and that's when you'll be able to pay more attention to your opponent uh, and when you start to receive strikes you'll start to understand it a little bit more so yeah, it's just going to take time, I'm afraid. Like everything else in Kendo, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, that's it. 
Um, thanks for the questions. Uh, it's a really short video today. Well, it's not a really short video looking at the time. What's that? Oh, 15 minutes already. So, okay. So, um, <laughs> I know there's loads more questions for me to get through. I will get through them. I promise I will. Uh, I am working through everything. Things are really nuts here at Kendo Star. KendoStar.com. That's where you should be shopping for your Kendo goods because that's the website I run, of course. It's the best one in the world. Uh, <laughs> uh, get to KendoStar.com. Make sure you're doing all your shopping there. KendoStar.com. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for watching. Uh, give me more questions in the comments down below wherever you're watching this. Uh, like, share, subscribe. You know what? all the stuff to do uh, and I'll see you all next time thanks for watching